right, we'll go ahead and get started. Some people might trickle in. Um, thank you guys for, for all coming. This is our second one and we've already grown by double. So um, this is awesome. I'd love to see this become a thing where a lot of parents come to and you guys can talk, communicate about what issues your child might have going on and offer each other solutions. So I think this is great that we're growing and hopefully we continue to grow. Um, obviously this month we're gonna be talking about kind of cyber parenting and how to search, look at devices. Um, just out of curiosity, who brought like child's device? One, two, couple? Okay, that's fine. Um, I just like to know because once we get into it, um, I see your eyes get real big or something. Um, <laughs> I know that I might have some work to do later. So, uh, biggest thing, um, and a couple hurdles before we get into the actual demonstrations of it um, is who owns the phone. Uh, the biggest thing is you guys are the owner of the phone. I don't care if the kids saved up all summer cutting grass to buy a, a new iPhone and they bought it and they pay for the service. They still live in your house. It is your guys' phone. You allow them to use the device. Um, I don't care if it was aunt, uncle, whoever bought this thing, if they're staying in your house, they're living under your rules. So that phone is 100% yours. Um, the flip side to that, I've had people roll their eyes, get upset with me. Um, a lot of parents don't like hearing it, but hear me out. You're responsible for what they're doing on their phone. You take full responsibility for them on the internet. We were just talking before about um, giving a kid keys to go drive a car around in New York City in the middle of the night. That's what these kids have at their fingertips on these devices. They have any and everything they can access. Um, and parents that aren't watching, aren't looking at things, it's very easy for them to get wrapped up in trouble, wrapped up in things they don't want to. Uh, but you guys are responsible for that. And we've seen legally some things start to come with parents getting charged in any of these active shooter events. Uh, we've seen a whole bunch of parents wrapped up for their child's responsibility. And I'll go into those stories in a little bit. Second big hurdle is understanding that there's no such thing as privacy for children. They're living in your house. Yes, there's some things that you probably want your children to keep private from you, but when it comes to their devices, if they're on it and you're asking who are you talking to, there's no hiding their phone, that phone is yours. It's also the responsibility aspect, but know that there's no privacy, there's no, well, I'm gonna leave them alone. Because as we saw when I talked about the alcohol substance abuse stuff last month, uh, parents are stopping as they're getting older and doing more dangerous activity. So as our seniors, our higher group using alcohol and substances, we're seeing parents back off as they get older and that's actually when they're getting in more trouble. Same thing with cell devices, the older they get, the more adult-like decisions they think they're making. Uh, um, and we see kids that are older getting in trouble, especially our 18 year olds, uh, because now they're not protected by juvenile law. So why search your kid's phone? Why believe that that phone's yours? Here's a couple real life examples. Uh, these two right here, uh, dad was charged for the actions of his son. This was an active shooter event. Um, his father was charged right here, 29 counts, second degree murder. Uh, essentially he allowed and let his son search these things. His son came to him for mental health. Uh, he told him, suck it up, it's too bad. The state's attorney took this and um, ended up charging father. Next one, this was the actual first event where mom and dad were both charged. Uh, they went in the phone. If the parents would have checked the phone, they would have seen the entire plans. They would have seen the finding of weapons, how I'm going to take these weapons. Um, but parents are getting charged for the actions of their kids. I only show you guys this to show the extreme of how bad things could get for something you didn't do. Your child can go make a decision, make all these plans, and there's state's attorneys that are out there that are going to come back on you and say you should have done something more to help it. All of these active shooters that I've studied, there's all been tons of data on these devices. Um, and if a little bit of thought would have went into it, they could have been prevented. I would argue all of them can be prevented with the proper monitoring and guarding of these devices. The last one, anybody know who that is? Well, I don't know the name's up there. Um, this is Miss Klebold. This is uh, the mother of the Columbine shooter, Dylan, Dylan Klebold. She has a whole TED talk. She wrote a book, made a whole bunch of money. 
Uh, but I pulled a couple things here and I throw out there that this is just my opinion. I get really fired up when I talk about her. Um, she goes into depth about how she didn't step foot in her child's room for over a year prior to the Columbine shootings. If she would have taken a step into that room, she would have found the gun that was used at Columbine, guns that were found at Columbine sitting in his closet. She would have found full-fledged maps of the entire school, full manifestos just by going into her son's room. Everything was sitting out when they did the raids at the house. She hadn't stepped foot in that room in over a year. Now, cell phones weren't a huge thing then, but that is a giant failure when it comes to parenting. She didn't care what her child was doing anymore. And her child was 18, he was about to go to college, so she was like, well, I'm gonna back off a little bit, and that's the direction it headed. This was prior to the parents getting charged, but know that even as they get older, if they're under your house and your roof, they're still your responsibility. Because I bet, and she says, I wanted to respect his privacy, so I didn't want to look. I didn't want to go into his room. I didn't want to invade his privacy. There's no such thing as privacy when it comes to somebody living in your house. They're under your rules, and you guys make those rules. So big thing with that, though, is how you approach the conversations with your kids. In talking with kids about technology, if you come to them and you berate them and say, if you ever go online, if you ever send naked pictures, if you ever um, get caught doing something bad, I'm gonna take your phone away, you're not gonna have any friends, you're not gonna go out ever. I've seen that approach. What happens when that kid gets in trouble online? Does that kid go to you? No. That kid says, I'm gonna figure this out myself because that cell phone is the most important thing I have and I'm not getting that thing taken away from me. I used to work up in North St. Louis County. Cell phones are so important to people that we had a large homeless population that all had cell phones. Every single homeless person that I interacted with all had cell phones. These kids are connected and live through that cell phone. They will do anything to not get that taken away. So what does that mean for discipline? That means that you have to set a clear expectation of if you're in trouble, I need you to come for me, come to me, and make sure that I can help you through something. Because I see kids every semester dig themselves deeper in a hole, trying to get out of problems and solve it themselves because they're scared of consequences. I like to call it a golden ticket. Hey, if you get in trouble, you're scared because something's happening online, come to me. Yeah, I'm probably gonna be upset, but we're gonna figure it out, okay? And build that confidence, build that trust with them. They can still be disciplined, there's no reason saying that you're not going to be in trouble, but don't come to them and say they're going to lose everything and never have their phone again, because then you cut off that line of communication completely. Out of curiosity, what age do we have? Elementary, anybody? No? One, two, okay. Middle school? A lot, perfect. High school? Awesome, almost the same group. Okay, so... For my elementary, I often hear my kid's too young for a phone, and this is normally grandma that's telling me this, um, so he just uses his iPad. There is almost no difference on the capabilities of what you can do with an iPad as what you can do with the phone. Everybody's using Wi-Fi now. You can use Wi-Fi to make phone calls. You can use Wi-Fi to text and send pictures. You don't need cellular service to do anything on an iPad that an iPhone can't. So I just like to break that down for uh, the young ones that have these devices. If they have a will to get on them and find these apps, and they do because their friends use them, they will find a way to message and get with other people. Big problem in our community as a whole, Monroe County, uh, NMK, not my kid. Um, when you catch yourself doing this, I'm not saying that you have a bad kid. You guys all raised great kids probably, but even great kids make mistakes. When you get in the thing, oh, my kid wouldn't do this, oh, my kid wouldn't do that, try to check yourself and think, is it possible for my kid to be a victim of something? Is it possible that my kid's hiding this because my kid's so perfect and he's embarrassed of this, or she's embarrassed of this? It's very possible for even the best kids that make the best decisions, one bad decision can snowball into a really bad situation for any one kid. So 
Make sure that you're checking those messages, photos, apps. When you don't check and when you don't put the effort and time into it, somebody else on the internet when it comes to kids is especially with our middle schoolers because they haven't quite understood the severity of how real things can get how quick. Our high schoolers have seen it. I've given them multiple presentations about it, um, but I still see some of them making the same mistakes. Last bullet point I have there is cyber crimes affect everybody. I had a family member and I come from a background of a police family um, who knew better than this. It doesn't matter who you are or how you were up brought, you can get caught up in one of these things. So I've had personally had family that's been affected by stuff like this and fell into the trap. They're very good at what they do. It's kind of like the phone scams. They do this all day for money. Um, even the best people can fall into mistakes. I want to go over what that kind of looks like. Um, got a quick video. The thing I love the most about that video is the folders it shows at the end. I deal with cases like that every single week. Every week through NEMEC, National Missing Exploited Children, they send in tips of stuff like that happening. Each individual cyber predator or sextortion predator on average has 250 victims per one suspect. So all those folders, generally speaking, is a different person they've done this to, which is crazy. So if you're finding this, if you're being told this by my child, hey, I have this person that's trying to get more photos out of me, trying to get money out of me, and I don't know what to do, know that there's probably 249 other girls and or boys that this is happening to. So take it seriously and make sure that you get that kid the help they need, whether that's calling me, reaching out to other parents. I'll give you guys stats on how often they actually know this other person, and it's alarming. Um, do something about it when you see it, because it can turn from, oh, this is my boyfriend one day, to now we're broken up and I hate you. Um, that happens very quick, and these kids send these photos, and they're often used um, in a way to try to get back at the other when these things happen. I see it all the time. So. The not my kid example, this is how it happens. Um, our, I've seen it boys and girls. This is a Tinder profile um, that I found. Um, this is pretty common. They all have 18 year olds um, as their age. They give in the actual thing that their age is 15. Shockingly enough, we also use stuff like this when we do stings like child predators. But a lot of high schoolers use these like dating apps same way, which is why the child predators get on there to actually try to talk to them. So your son and or daughter gets on and they see this cute girl that's saying they're 15, they know him at school, they end up matching with that kid. Um, kid. What often then happens is they send the photo of the most attractive person they could find on google.com and they say, all right, it's your turn to send me a picture. Even the best kids, they'll harass, 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 send the picture, and then it's a, it's a gotcha. It's I'm going to send this to everybody you know, I'm gonna send this to your friends, your family, um, and kids panic because the kids don't know what to do. These are all real examples of texts we've had in the area. And it's shocking the people that will send these. It's not the 50 year old in the basement that's sitting there typing with all those things like in the video. Often it's kids doing this to other kids they know, which is terrifying. I mean, these, those speak for themselves. Biggest things to know, what that's called, the act of trying to get more photos and or coerce somebody to send them, it's called sextortion. 60% um, of the victims this happened to do not report it. They're scared, they don't know what to do, and they feel like they can find their own way out rather than just ask for help, especially from a trusted adult. 50% of the time it's over social media. That's probably a higher number now. This is from 2022. Rarely do these people go in person. That's your boyfriend, girlfriend situation. That's happening less and less because there's more people around that are taking this seriously. And the most shocking to me is here at the bottom, a third of the time it's somebody they actually know doing this to them. It's not just that creeper in the basement. 33% of the time it's somebody they actually know, somebody that goes to their school, somebody that plays on their team. 
you need to be checking their devices because just checking it, that's a third of the thing this thing happens to that could be prevented. Almost all cybercrime can be prevented, and I hope to give you guys some of the tools to actually go and find these things so it stops happening to our kids. Continuing on, it doesn't happen here. Um, we just did a child sex trafficking operation uh, through one of our undercover agencies. They did it over at a local hotel. They arrested six people. This one was prior. They arrested six people for going to meet a 15 year old in a hotel here in Columbia. It's happening here. It's not something that's just far away and happening somewhere else. This one I believe was in Fairview. Um, it's happening here and it's real. Why does any of this matter? If your kid has this going on, uh, this is an example from Amanda Todd. This was in 2012. This was a video she posted 12 hours before she ended up committing suicide. Seventh grade, we shouldn't be having to deal with this. When we were younger, we'd do dumb stuff, play truth or dare, and it would end that night. We would mess with our buddies at school. Um, we'd go home and it ended because our buddies weren't there. Cyberbullying and this harassment doesn't stop now. It follows them home and there's no escape for some of these kids. She's no longer here because of what I just described happening happened. And this was a big, that video originally is about nine minutes long. Um, that family didn't have a lot of time to intercept it prior to her taking her own life. But 12 hours prior, that's all on the device. Everything was there, everything was written out, everything was on her phone to find when they ended up finding her. If you don't care for any of the legal stuff or the potential legal consequences that could come your way, we care about our children and I don't wanna ever have to bury another child here in Columbia because of something like this, okay? It's our responsibility to keep them safe and to be that guardian for them because sometimes they don't see how serious this can become. Big tips here in talking to them, know your kid's baseline. For any females in the room, uh, maternal instincts is a big thing. I know growing up, that my mother, as soon as I walked in the door, would know if I had a good day or a bad day. You guys have that gut feeling. Uh, when something's different, you guys, generally speaking, have a very good tell of what's going on. There's a lot of biology that goes into that of um, taking care of babies and cavemen time and all that, but trust your gut. Um, and not just the females. If you know that your kid comes in, high fives you and says hi to you every day, and he comes in depressed with his head down, doesn't say anything to you, something happened and it's your guys' job to kind of figure out what's going on. Generally speaking, with a 16 to 18 year old, you're gonna get a meh, I don't care, everything's fine. Um, I'd say that's probably gonna be pretty common. But keep digging, keep asking, and show your support for them. Third point, not sharing what you did when you were a child. I know that everybody's probably got wonderfully crazy stories to tell. Um, about what they did when they were a kid and all the fun stuff that you guys got into. But your child looks up to you as the perfect role model until you prove otherwise. Once you start telling them, well, I did this, I sent these photos, I got arrested with alcohol, I got caught, your child now believes that they're hero and what they look up to, that's acceptable behavior. So we have to hold ourselves to that high standard around them because if you are doing the same thing, then why should they listen to you telling them not to do it, okay? So that's a tough part of walking the walk with them. It's really tough because you wanna sympathize and be there. Hitting on that bottom point, your kids need a mentor. They have enough friends at school. They have enough friends, they need a mentor. They don't need another pal. They need somebody that's there for them, supports them, and is giving them guidance, not a friend. Okay, moving kind of deeper into the actual technology, and we're real close to actually going through the phones. Um, you guys don't have to actually raise your hands for it, but allowing the cell phone in the room at night. What are our thoughts, if any? 
Does anybody not allow cell phone in a room? Cool. One of the best piece of his pieces of advice that I could give is keeping that cell phone out of the room because when you're asleep, even if you do everything all the time, you check that phone daily, um, when you go to sleep, the child sits awake on their phone like that because they don't go to bed till 3, 4 a.m. How do I know? They tell me about it at school. I was up all night playing Fortnite with my buddies, scrolling on Snapchat, making TikToks, um, all kinds of fun stuff. So they're awake using their devices. They tell me about it. They tell me the stuff they do on them. I don't know why, but keep those devices out of the room. What I've heard is, especially for your split stories, keep that phone on the first story, keep that phone charged and or plugged in in a main living room. Um, those are all ways to prevent, especially stuff like that video happening because they're taking that phone in a private space, private space, where they feel like they can be more adventurous, really push the boundaries. If you keep that phone out of the room at night, there is no chance that while you're asleep, something could potentially be happening with them and their device. Is there a chance they sneak out and go grab their phone in the living room? Sure. But you're safeguarding and you're making a effort and attempt, I don't care if you put it in your room, you're making an attempt to actually curb some of this behavior because when I get people come to me with these sextortion cases, it was all they were on the phone alone with no supervision in the middle of the night and we thought it'd be a good idea to hop on some chat room or start Snapchatting some random person that added us. That's. 50% of the time probably. So get those, de get those devices out of their rooms and you'll start to see not only benefits with how they are interacting with people, but mental health benefits, this amount of sleep they're able to get. Uh, screen time prior to bed has awful effects on your health. Um, and if nothing else, push that to them as the reason why, is I care about your health and I don't want you rotting your brain scrolling for five hours before you go to sleep. Push that aspect, uh, but try to get that phone out of the room. So here are some of the common apps. Some of these are older, a lot of them are still in play, but when you look at your child's phone, these are some apps that you might see and not recognize immediately. Um, when I was in high school, it was Facebook, Snapchat had just come out, um, and Twitter. Those were the only apps that anybody used. Right now, children use a whole bunch of different apps that you wouldn't recognize if you didn't actively monitor kind of the trends and what's going on. TikTok is by far the number one app that these kids are using and these kids are all communicating mainly on Snapchat. Kids no longer send standard SMS phone number to phone number text messages, generally. Kids are messaging on Snapchat because Snapchat was built on the principle of you send it, it goes away and it's gone forever. I tell them this and I'll tell you this, I have access to the last 30 days of Snapchat data with a search warrant, so if something does happen on Snapchat with a search warrant, I can get 30 days of data any and every message sent, any and every photo sent. Um, so Snapchat, it's gone forever, doesn't really apply. Um, and feel free to continue to reiterate that with them, but that's why kids tell me, yeah, I snap because my messages go away and my parents can't check it. That's in their mind what they're doing. Some other big apps on here, I showed that dating profile app, Bumble is one of the dating apps, Grindr is another dating app. Um, hot or not, when I talk about middle schoolers, I believe this one was shut down, but there's many that are popping up just like it. Hot or not was an app, you pulled up the app, you would rate a photo one to 10 and it'd be geo-based, um, so it would give each person a score. I've seen a whole bunch of bullying-based things on this. Hey, everybody go download this. We're gonna rate this person as low as we can and they're gonna feel awful at school. It'd be hilarious. See that all the time when that app was running. It's terrible, it really is. Um, some other common apps, just talked about Snapchat. I'll go into a whole in-depth thing on Snapchat later. Know that this is the number one app that the kids are using to communicate. It's also the number one app that we find sex predators on. Discord. Discord is a communication app. There's very good aspects to Discord. Um, there's very good aspects to a lot of these apps. But I wanna give you guys some knowledge on what I've seen them used for and how some of these can be abused. 
for many of you, do your guys' kids play like video games? By raise of hands, just so I have a, oh, everybody, cool. Um, not shocking. So a lot of kids that game or play games online use Discord as a communication base. If you have an Xbox, you used to not be able to talk with a PlayStation, so everybody got Discord so you could talk to each other. Um, that's how Discord started. Now, what it's used as is I have younger kids on like Fortnite. What I'll see with some of the predators and some other people is they'll try to pull that child to Discord. They'll say, hey, go download Discord. I'm gonna send you a link in Fortnite chat um, and or any other medium they're on. And they'll try to pull them away from the app or game they're on to start talking to them on Discord. As soon as they pull that person away from the app, it's generally speaking not a friend unless it's somebody they know. Why do they do this? Because some of these companies' servers are all based in other countries. When I talk about uh, specific like WhatsApp and Kick, some of their servers are based in like the Netherlands. So when I go to get search warrants for data on stuff, it's really hard when I don't speak the language to write a search warrant and get data on something that's in the Netherlands or Sweden. Um, that's why they're pulling them off US-based things that we can actually investigate. WhatsApp is how you would communicate without SMS texting. That is all through Wi-Fi. So if I had an iPad, like my eight-year-old I was talking about, my eight-year-old was telling me about how they message their friends on their iPad, so that's all through WhatsApp. WhatsApp, you can make phone calls, you make texts. It's just like a regular phone, but it works strictly off of Wi-Fi. You can buy like minute cards. I've never seen a kid buy a minute card, um, but you can. TikTok, number one, um, I haven't seen a ton of kids messaging each other on TikTok. I have seen the cyber criminals trying to um, take them to other apps. TikTok is something that uh, supposedly might be getting banned here in January, maybe. Um, but TikTok is something that they're constantly on. All their friends are on it. That's a medium where I'll talk about their ghost accounts, their spam accounts, their Finsta accounts. Um, if you think that you're safe because you're following your child's TikTok account, I'm gonna show you a way to ensure that you're actually following their account. If they're using these apps and you notice that they haven't been active, they haven't posted, um, reposted or liked stuff on there, they probably have a second account. And when I look at middle and high schoolers, almost all of them have a TikTok account and 75% of them have a second account, they call them spam accounts, that they'll post like the fun, fun stuff they're doing with their friends, um, but their parents are following their main TikTok account, so they have no idea what's going on. I'll show you guys how to actually find those things. Okay, any questions about any of that before I go into the, jump into the actual demonstration stuff? Anything? What's up? On that, you said you can go back 30 days on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a crime base. Snapchat has historically, this is my opinion, Snapchat has historically been bad working with law enforcement up until recently where we saw a whole bunch of this stuff happen and then kids taking their lives. So now they've kind of revamped and they made a law enforcement portal. Um, they're really working with us now for any kind of crime. Right now it's just crimes. I'll give you an app that actually monitors their Snapchat and you'd get like alerts um, if there were certain messages or things that would pop up even on Snapchat. But that 30 days is reserved for any kind of actual crime just based on privacy data and some other stuff. So I wish, it'd be cool, wouldn't it? Right. Anything else? Cool, all right, so when you get to your messages, um, this one's super basic. This is what I see when I talk to parents about searching devices. This is generally what parents are doing. They go to the phone, they hit the texting app, a uh, little green squiggly for iPhones with the white bubble, and they're looking at messages. As I said, kids are generally speaking using Snapchat to communicate now, um, so there's not probably gonna be a lot outside of you and your family for most kids. Some kids are a little bit different and they still like old school texting. Most kids have moved to a different outside app because most parents only check these messages. 
Big thing in asking, especially with your middle schoolers and or younger, um, how do you know this person is a key question to ask. Um, if it's, I have no idea, um, I don't know, uh, any of the stuttering, the questioning of it, it's probably somebody they met on a game, maybe a Fortnite, Call of Duty, I don't know what else, Minecraft, a whole bunch of these games are playing now. Um, if they're messaging with these people, I would start to inquire some of the specific questions about who they're actually talking with. I like to go off of a couple things have to be known, first name, last name, and where they go to school. If you can't tell me that, it's probably not somebody you should be texting, um, especially for my young ones. Even for older ones, if they're messaging somebody that lives four states over and they're four years older than them, probably not a great idea. So if you see a name you don't recognize, it's important to just get, hey, who is this person? Um, that'll also give you a really good base on how much information your child gives you for something that's not even necessarily nefarious. Maybe it's just somebody you haven't met, a name you haven't seen. Um, that's Joe that plays for my soccer team. He lives on Braddington. Uh, you'll get a good gauge of how honest your child is with their device just based off asking them simple questions like this. Encouraging them to not delete messages. You know that they're on their device. Um, if there's no messages for months at a time, they're messaging people somewhere, um, encourage them, and I would make it a rule for them not to be deleting their messages. It makes it very easy to tell when conversation abruptly switches from one thing to the next when messages are missing. Um, so that's a good rule of thumb. You get them to adhere to that. Um, you're golden when it comes to text messages. As I said, they're not really using SMS, they're using the apps. Going into photos. So if you pop your Photos app open, I'm gonna grab my phone just so I can walk you guys through a lot of these things. So the first thing when you pop your Photos open is you're probably going to see your camera. And if you don't, we have the block screen. We all there? Yes? I'll kind of come around. Blocks. Is that the photo or the camera? Camera, okay, you'd hit that little square. So if you get the camera, you would hit the little square at the bottom and get to your actual photos. So that's the camera, you want the actual photo screen. We all there? Yeah, cool. So what you do in your photo screen, you're going to hit albums, which is the one, two, three from the bottom. Anybody have a Samsung in the room? Couple, okay. You guys are a little bit different. It's a three line, one, two, three, um, and it should say albums. Yes? Yeah. Sweet, okay. So on the Samsung devices, there's more nooks and crannies per se to put them, but there's three things, three lines, and that actually shows um, your folders. For the iPhone users, if you scroll down to the bottom, once we're in your albums, you'll have a utility section that'll say hidden and deleted. We see that? Yes, so if you hit your hidden, there is um, potentially hidden photos. You can categorize photos into that hidden album. Just by tr clicking that photo, you could drag it there. I see kids when they're doing stuff they shouldn't be, a lot of vaping in the bathroom is generally speaking in the hidden or deleted photos. Um, the hidden folders often where I find those. And then when it comes to any kind of sexting thing, if you go out, the thing below that is the recently deleted. So when you go to check their phone, that's the first place that I normally check because right before they hand you that phone, uh, they're going through and they're mass deleting any and everything they don't want you to see. The iPhone holds that for 30 days. The Android, um, in their deleted photos, I believe it's 30 days as well. Um, the only issue with your recently deleted is that once it's in there, you could delete it potentially again, and that's how it would be off the device. There's ways to get it back by restoring iCloud and some other stuff, really high-tech things. The kids don't know how to do that, but they do know if I delete this and then go to recently delete it and delete it again, that that's essentially going to be gone unless you guys do like an iCloud backup, okay? So was everybody able to find the hidden and deleted? Yes, easy, okay. Did anybody not know about those? Cool, okay. 
So those are the number one area. I also encourage you when you go through looking at the actual videos and or screenshots. Video screenshots are a big thing. Kids will often, when they're sending inappropriate things, they'll get Buddy to come over, they'll open it, and I'm gonna record it right off your phone. That's gonna get saved as an actual video, not something that they held down and saved onto their device. Going into the App Store or the Google Play Store. I have an iPhone, so I'm a little biased on how I talk. I'm sorry, my Samsung users. Um, if you go to your Play Store or your device, you'll see a screen um, that looks something like this. You go to your home page. On the top right is your profile. You'll hit that profile. I have 188 apps to update, that's awesome. Um, once you hit that profile, the top thing says apps. When you hit apps, you will see any and every app that's ever been downloaded on that device, whether it's deleted or not. So when you scroll down, when you look at the iPhone version, there's a little cloud, the Samsung version, um, it's a little G maybe. Um, but the iPhone has a small little cloud. That means it's been deleted, it's no longer on that device. Everybody able to get there? So as you scroll, there's probably hundreds of apps that have been downloaded, depending on how long your child's had a phone. Um, if you don't immediately recognize those apps, I normally recommend Googling it to see what it's for. Um, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of them, but there are some apps out there that I don't know to heart. So what I would do, if I saw something I have no idea what it is, I'd go download it and see what it does. You can go to the App Store on your phone and or that phone, click download and go see what that thing actually does. This is big when it comes to Snapchat or your kid being grounded from their device. What they'll do is they'll delete Snapchat off of the phone. You'll go to search for Snapchat on it and you won't be able to find Snapchat because they deleted it off the device. As soon as they get to school and or on the bus or away from you, they'll go to their app store, they'll re-download it, all their data's still there. So if they've had it, Know that it can be re-downloaded and then deleted right away before you get back. The good thing to know with Snapchat specifically is if you re-download it and you log in as them, which you could even do on your own device, if you log in as them, you can pull up all those messages. The messages don't go away, even if they delete the app. So if they're deleting it and re-downloading it, it's okay because that stuff's all still there. Questions on the App Store? Okay. Okay, so here's a quick little exercise. So if you go back to the main screen of your app store and you put in this, like search for this, hide my photos up on the search bar, I'm just intrigued what's going to come up for a lot of you. Hide my photos or hide my pictures. I encourage you once you hit search to scroll down and see just how many apps have been created to actually hide photos. Mm -hmm. Oh, I heard. And I'll talk about the calculator here in a minute. But there's a whole bunch of apps that were created to look and designed to be something else. So that when you go and search the phone, nobody's going to think to go click on a second calculator. What I can tell you is paying attention, no kid has loves math enough to have two calculators on their phone. So if you see two calculators, one of them's probably a vault. Um, also in looking at the app store, generally speaking, those apps will have something extra behind their name. So if it says calculator, hide my photos, it's probably for photos. Um, but if you see two calculators, that's a definite red flag. I did a little screen recording that I'll talk you guys through with this. Was everybody able to find those? Okay, so I typed in hide my photos on here. The first app that popped up was this calculator. That's the number one that I see most of the time. I'll go through and actually set it up after it downloads on here. But these calculators are pretty amazing. They can work as a real calculator, like I'll type in five times five here in a minute. 
I didn't want it to steal all my data. Um, so you could type in and actually use this as a real calculator, but when I figure this one out in about 10 seconds, you type in a passcode. For me, it's one, two, three, four, five, six uh, percent. As soon as you type that in, it opens an entire vault that you could put photos into. I figured it out right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hit the percent sign. And I could store all of this stuff in here. And you'd never know unless you entered that passcode. So you could sit there all day long and play with the calculator and you could put whatever you want in any kind of album that would not show up in your photos, that would not show up in your hidden and or deleted. This stuff only exists inside of that app because as soon as you put it into that app, it deletes it. It gets rid of it from everywhere else on the phone and it's only inside of this app. This is just me showing that the calculator actually works. I tried to enter one, two, three, four, five, six a whole bunch of times to like crack into it. Um, it's not possible unless you enter the right code. So big thing, if you see a calculator, if you see a photo vault, there's some apps that are called vaults. If you see something and it has a passcode, your kid knows what the passcode is. Um, they're not dumb. They, they know how to get into these things, um, especially when you start looking at things like Snapchat and Maya's only, which we'll get here in a second. So calculators number one, be on the lookout for two calculators on the device, never a great sign. At least it means they're hiding something. What? I don't know, but if there's two calculators, there's more on that device. Safari and internet. So if you go to your internet, Safari, Chrome, Bing, uh, whatever internet service, I'll use Safari to explain it and probably get out of the way so we can see. If you go to the bottom on the right here, this is a tab page. When you go through your tabs, it's any and everything that has been opened that's not closed out. You could do things like incognito mode. That incognito mode will temporarily close out and hide when you close the app. If you go into your actual Google account, um, those kids that search these things are saved within the Google account. So if you go to the actual Gmail and or Yahoo or Bing, Yahoo and Gmail are the big ones. If you go to that account, you're able to pull up any and every um, thing that is searched. If you're seeing a whole bunch of sketchy websites, I often see things like um, Yandex, which is Russian Google. Um, Y-A-N-D-E-X. I wouldn't Google it here because you might get a virus, but um, Russian Google is what it is. It is a unfiltered Google. Google works with NEMAC, which is that missing child exploitation. Uh, these other countries have Google systems that don't filter anything out, and that's how you get the real violent stuff on your phone that's just completely unfiltered. Um, so that would all be located right there in the internet. But scroll through those. If they have 500 tabs open, I'm sure that you'll figure out what they're using that device for, but the internet is a good place to look if they're using any of these sketchy websites. Talked about Finstas. Um, following their social media. Just because you follow their main page doesn't mean that that's the only thing they're using. Often, as I said, about 75% of these kids have a second account. So what I'd encourage you to do is, well, most of you probably have kids. If you have a TikTok, Instagram, or any one of those accounts, open that and go to your child's page. I'll give you a minute. You guys can actually go do it if you'd like. No? <laughs> So you would go to your child's page. I'll use TikTok because it's the easiest and they all use it. When you go to their TikTok page, it's normally got their smiling, wonderful face and their followers, who they're following, and then how many likes they have on their videos. They love when their number looks like that. Um, if you click the following and or followers, a search bar will come up at the top. I encourage you to type in spam, type in their name. Um, you, spam? S -P -A -M. I know, but what, what is that going to give me? 
Spam will give you any and every person that they follow that has a spam account, and the first person that's normally followed on their account is normally their spam account, because they have to have that extra follower. So this is a back-end way to find the spam accounts, the second accounts that they might have. So you click their friends and or followers, and you look for themselves in those friends or followers. Does that make sense? So you just search when you're in the followers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that. So I'm on Tyler's Instagram. Uh huh. And I just searched spam, and that came up, which I think that's one of the friends, yep. right? But and if you go here to following, so he's only got one. If you click here, type it in for hers. So that's good. He only has one then. But that's. But that's mm -hmm. So you'll see a whole bunch, what I'm talking about with all these kids, if you just type in that spams there, you'll see a whole bunch more. Um, the real rat. They went into that spam account. Mm -hmm. Now search spam. And that's going to potentially show me. A whole bunch. I would say if he didn't follow his own. So they have to have spam in the name. They don't have to. I've seen Finsta. I've seen fake. Um, and there's a handful here. His name is not here. I've seen, like my name's Tyler. His name's Tyler too. Uh, I've seen not Tyler's TikTok. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, but if you go and you look at their followers and there's a second account that has their name attached to it, um, that's probably the account they're actually using. I'd say for boys, generally speaking, there's not a ton of boys that are posting TikToks all the time. I see a lot of what is it, resharing? Um, I believe that's what they call it, or reposting. So they'll do reposting, which comes in this middle. This is reposting. This left side is what they're actually posting. Um, when it comes to boys, they generally speaking like a whole bunch of stuff. If you go on your kid's TikTok, you can see everything they like by clicking this. This button shows everything that they like. So that's a good insight to who they're hanging out with, who they're talking, what they're doing. What's up? So so when you click, you can see like she has friends that have mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was only one, but then when I went on, I, oh, I clicked that person's page, and then the spam account, and then selected spam or search spam again, and then about eight or ten names listed. Still not like it. Right. <laughs> So there you go. You go check. Uh, so that's the page I need to go to. So, and generally speaking, they think that you guys have no idea how to find these. Um, and that's the kids that are confident to say, here's my phone. You can check my whole TikTok because I know there's nothing on this account. Um, everything's on my other account that's not Tyler or not me. Um, that's what I see often when it comes to TikTok. Number one, uh, Snapchat. Snapchat is the most common thing that I deal with when it comes to cyber crimes and or uh, bullying, uh, sexting, a whole bunch of that stuff. When you open Snapchat, this is the screen that pops up. If you guys want to do this with me, great. If you don't, that's cool. Um, you could log into your child's Snapchat account and you would see all of this. Um, so if you have their login information, that's a good way to keep them honest as well. But when you log in, go ahead and click this little window frame. That window frame is going to take you, whoop, let's skip forward, take you to this screen right here. This screen, you can scroll at the top, snap stories, camera roll. My eyes only is what you're looking for. If you scroll over to my eyes only, and it looks like this, you're probably okay because it hasn't been set up. The only way for it to look different, like this, is if they've set, put something in there prior. So if you go to my eyes only and it looks like this, they do not have anything in there because it doesn't exist. If you scroll over at the top and it looks like that, your child knows the passcode because they are the only person that set that passcode. And they know the passcode, and I encourage you, if they act as if they don't, to not give them their device until you let them open that for you. So if you find that, know that there's something in there and they 
probably don't want you to see it. Um, but it's important to know kind of what's going on. Going back, if you click the chat button from your home screen, it'll take you to all their current snaps. I encourage parents to get very smart with emojis. Uh, each emoji can represent very, very different things. Um, I look for things like the snowman, tree leaves. Um, here's a list of drugs that could be uh, emojis. Does that mean if you see a tree, it means weed? No. Um, but oftentimes when you see a name with like two or three of these things behind them, know that there's a good chance that this person could be involved in something like that. I absolutely, when it comes to dealers, I see the plug, the money, all these all the time. When it comes to actual dealers, I do see those every time they got some kind of special thing um, because of somebody they don't really know. So they give them a whole bunch of emojis um, for a name. Here's some other general teenage emojis. Uh, hunted, keep it hunted, as they like to say. Um, what are some other ones? Clown. This is a cap. Um, that means that that person's lying. I encourage you to look into some of these emojis. I got a two minute video that's gonna hit on some of the... This presentation will be on YouTube, so you can slow that down, because she's way too excited to be talking about all that. But um, there is a lot that they communicate through these emojis. Um, I've seen full conversations of just emojis, zero words, um, and they're doing this for 10 minutes at a time, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Uh, become efficient in what they're doing, and if you see a whole bunch of emoji conversations, just ask them what's going on. For the real young ones, my elementary age kids, uh, a lot of times with my elementary, they just think it's fun to use them. Um, they think emojis are the coolest thing ever. Um, so with the real young ones, it's generally speaking that. Um, when they're older, high school, upper middle school, uh, they're using them for words. Another thing when you get on Snapchat is your Snap Map. You can see the Snap Map by going to Map from your home screen. That snap map shows the location. Why do I tell you guys this? I've seen kids stalk other kids using this snap map. I've seen kids show up at their house because I wasn't invited to your party. Now I'm gonna come ruin your party, uh, call the cops, cause a scene, a uh, whole bunch of stuff. I encourage you to get your kid on ghost mode, uh, which they know what that means, but take your kid off of this map. It's a setting where you can get their location off. Um, that way that people can't see their location. There's no reason uh, a kid from 13 to 17 needs every one of their friends to know exactly where they're at. Get them off of this snap map. Um, it's just not safe. Wrapping up, got a couple minutes. Uh, biggest takeaways, as I said, the number one hurdle is to just accept that your child's device is your responsibility. I don't want to have to be the person uh, pressing a case against a parent because you didn't check their phone or check the room for a year and you thought everything was fine. If we take responsibility of those devices and continue to check them, we're not gonna have kids uh, being bullied to the point where they think they wanna commit suicide. We're not going to be having kids bullied into sending more pictures when it comes to sextortion. If you guys are looking and monitoring these things, you can catch it. All cybercrime is preventable with the right tools. Again, there's no good age to stop checking. Um, each kid's different. You guys know your kid. If they're living in your house, they're living under your rules. That's how I take it. Um, Mr. Klebold was 18 when he decided to do that, and her Miss Klebold's biggest thing is, uh, I wish I would have done more. So just because your child's older, if they're in the house, doesn't mean that they just get to do whatever they want. Your house, your rules. Become fluent in the apps they're using. If you see them on, I'll use Discord. If they're on Discord 24 seven, learn what they're doing. For the younger fifth, sixth, seventh, sit down and do it with them. Um, tell them to show me how this works. If they're hesitant to show you things in the apps or what's going on within them, 
something's probably going on. And then be consistent. Make sure that every time something happens, you're consistent about it. If your kid comes to you and shows you something that makes you really upset that's getting sent, it's really easy to fall into that berating, uh, you're never getting this back. But I encourage you to have those open conversations and be consistent with the rules and know that there's still gonna be discipline, but don't shut down that communication line just because you're upset of a decision they made because they felt comfortable enough to bring this to you and bring, hey, I don't know what to do, I'm scared, this is happening. They brought that to you. Don't be a reason that they don't come to you again if something happens. Make sense? Last thing I'll hit on, and then we'll draw our Amazon raffle. Bark is what I would recommend when it comes to monitoring applications. Bark is a software that you can download on any phone and it would monitor any and all apps you connect to it. Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, the internet, SMS messages. If it gets anything of bullying, harassment, uh, any kind of sexual words, you would get a alert put to your phone that said, this just happened at this time um, on this app. Those alerts also allow you to view it remotely with specific apps, such as Snapchat. Um, you could log in as if you're them and look at messages within there. Bark is a very good software to have. They make their own phone that you can do even more with. You can turn off specific things. You can turn off the internet, turn on the internet. Um, you can pretty much control their device through this. If you don't have the actual Bark device, can they delete this? Yes, but you would get a notification that it was deleted. So, I highly recommend Bark. They don't pay me, uh, but I do have a free subscription from Bark forever. Um, and just testing it out with me and my wife's phone, I love everything that this thing can do. Um, and the alerts are pretty cool. So it's live time monitoring, and they have somebody that's sitting there monitoring alerts at all times. If you're more interested in that, I can give you more details on it. Um, does anybody have any questions?